Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really exciting to see so many people here today. Um, I'm Margaret Mantor. I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in the Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. And um, I wanted to introduce the lecture today. This is part of the conservation lecture series. And um, in the back of the room, when you came in, hopefully you saw some sign-in sheets. We've also got a schedule of the upcoming lectures for the lecture series. Um, so you can plan on coming to future lectures. If you have any questions about any upcoming lectures, I'm the person to contact. And um, also in the back of the room today, we have note cards, and that's for questions. If you have a question for the speaker, um, if you could please write it down on one of the cards and then pass it over to either side, and we'll collect those at the end and read them um, so we can have our speaker answer questions. And, and Juan has some as well that he can pass around. So um, today we are really excited to have Dr. Peter Moyle giving his presentation. Dr. Moyle has um, worked on the ecology of California's freshwater fishes since 1969. And he's a professor at the University of California at Davis in the Department of Wildlife, Fish, and Conservation Biology. And he's also the Associate Director of the Center for Watershed Sciences at UC Davis. Um, he has published over 200 scientific publications as well as 10 books on the biology and status um, and trends of California's inland fishes. That includes Inland Fishes of California, um, which is a benchmark reference on California's freshwater fishes. Most recently, his lab has been conducting statewide assessments of um, fish status, and they're using a new methodology for predicting impacts of climate change on native and alien fish species. So we are very pleased to have him here today. Is this, is this on now? Yes. Familiar, familiar places in the audience. I'm, thanks for coming. We talked before, so I hope some of this will be. I first wanted to do what I should not do, which is try to explain droughts, climate change, and dams, oh my. Uh, so I have some idea of. Um, lions and tigers and bears can be. Uh, the Tin Man and the Scarecrow, as they, you know, that, I suspect it's not working completely. Okay. Okay, let's try this. Okay, great. Um, they march on, they, uh, they chant, make this chant. They meet the lion. It seems to be um... <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll I'll, tr I'll try this. Is this? No. Do I have to hold this up? No. Okay, you can hear me now. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> So as I mentioned, the you know the lion turns out to be a help, and I like to think of drought in that way, something that we can help us figure out how to respond to climate change. Um, and um, because you know, as the the basic response I've seen so far to this present drought is sort of surprise that it's actually happened. You know, here we're finally it's finally hit us, and we, in a way, this has been on its way for a long time. You know, the last major drought of somebody this severe, so dramatic, was in the 1970s, and we need to be looking at this as a learning experience, the way we can do better next time. Um, so in this talk, what I want to do is re briefly re review the effects of climate change. Um, get everything working. Uh-oh. Now I can't get this to work. Uh, <laughs> Everything except the slides. Okay, so so this will work out. Okay, okay. So this is what I want to do. I could talk briefly about the drought. 
Um, then um, uh, talk about why climate change is especially hard on our uh, native uh, aquatic habitats and fishes. Um, then, I, but I want to really, really want to do is spend time talking about solutions. That's really what I'm interested in, um, and how what we can do to reduce the impacts of drought and climate change uh, on our native fishes, assuming we make the decision that we want the native fishes around. Because that's really it's a societal decision. We can we can maybe maybe we'll, we'll all be perfectly happy with largemouth bass and carp everywhere. Uh, I hope not, but that's a choice we'll be making. Um, and I do I tend to end on a fairly optimistic note by introducing the concept of reconciliation ecology uh, as a basis for future action. Um, well, here's the drought. <clears throat> you know, it's really the third dry year. Uh, it's been, we had a little bit of rain. It made this all, you know, boosts our optimism a bit, but that really wasn't enough to do as much as it needs to be done. And we have to hope it'll keep raining steadily for the next three months or next month and a half or so. Um, you had a whole year without significant rain, as you know, and that uh, should be a wake-up call. Uh, the reservoirs are nearly empty, and these fish versus people arguments are rising up again, as you, you heard from all the legislation going on in the federal government right now. Um, and you want to blame the fish for the lack of water for people when it's really our bad planning, uh, or inadequate planning, I should say, maybe, to be more diplomatic, that, that has these things happening. Uh, and But uh, we have to recognize that under climate change scenarios, uh, these conditions are likely to become chronic, or at least more frequent. Uh, and that's what we have to start expecting to start working for. This is so we should look upon the drought as an opportunity to figure out how to do things better. Um, well, first off, climate change, uh, I'll tell you the obvious to start out with. It's already happening. It's, CO2 is continuing to rise. Human populations are continuing to grow at the same time. Um, our, and it's also worth pointing out our models for climate change generally only go to 2100. There's some other ones now around, but you know, and there's no sign of things magically ending at 2100 either. So we do have to figure climate change is an ongoing thing, unless we can really do something about it. And this is generally not good for good news for either fish or people. But again, we have to keep in mind this is if present trends continue, and if maybe and they. It depends on whether we can solve these, some of these problems or not. But I want to talk especially about predicted effects on aquatic ecosystems. Um, uh, and the, the list right here is I'll just go through this fairly, fairly quickly. Um, first off, the sea level rise. Um, <clears throat> it depends on which model you let you, you're looking at, but sea level's already, already been rising. It's been rising for the last century, as a matter of fact. Uh, but uh, up to 1.7 meters by 2100. Uh, that's very significant, and, that, and those are probably conservative estimates. Um, and with this rapid rise of sea level, much more rapid than it has been historically, and with the hardened, hardened fringes of all our estuaries, that is, we've urbanized our estuaries, we have hardened fringes, we have, uh, there's not much place for the, for the estuarine habitats to expand up into uh, other places now. Um, there's going to be a net loss of estuarine habitat uh, as a result of sea level rise, and we uh, have to take that into account. Um, and I'm not going to say much more about that, but I'll get to say, get to just mention it briefly towards the end of the talk, too. But it, it, it is very significant when you think about our anadromous fish and other species that have to pass through the estuaries. Estuaries statewide are a very important habitat that we're, that's going to be diminishing. It's going to make it even harder uh, to restore some of our uh, native fishes. Well, precipitation is the other, another big effect of climate change, of course. There's less annual precipitation on average. Uh, the question is always how much left and the model less, how much less. And the models give you varying results. It's, they're much less certain about precipitation because there's so many complicating factors here. But I think you can count on things being more variable at the very least. Uh, we still have our Mediterranean pattern of precipitation will continue with, you know, most precipitation in winter and spring, but the, the details of this pattern are going to change dramatically, uh, and that's going to make a huge difference to the fish. Uh, and, and one of the most important things, of course, is to recognize that um, we're seeing less snow and more rain. Uh, you know, currently the biggest single reservoir in California is our snowpack, uh, and that's very important for fish as well as for people. So as we lose the snowpack, and they're talking about up to 90% loss in the Sierra Nevada, uh, which is our biggest snowpack, that's going to have a huge impact on the way uh, we manage our water. Uh, and stream flows then, because of this, are going to be more variable. Our peaks 
peak flows are likely to be larger in some years, not all years, but generally larger, and they're going to be earlier, uh, a month or more earlier than they are today. Um, again, that, if you're adapted, if you're fish adapted for a particular flow regime, that can be distressing. And the base flows are going to last longer, that is the low flow conditions are going to last longer, uh, and they're going to be lower. Uh, and obviously some streams are going to dry up that are not permanent. So this is the reality we're facing there. Uh, for example, here's, this is a um, hydrograph that uh, Rebecca Canonez has uh, generated for the Salmon River in, in the Klamath Basin. Uh, just one example, you can see here that the uh, climate change, the CC, uh, the altered flows, push the peak flows off you know, a month earlier uh, than they are for the historic flows. And then the, the, the rest flows of the rest of the year are, are going to be lower than they are with uh, the summer flows being especially low. And this is a very typical kind of shift in the hydrograph we're going to see. Uh, and this is something the fish have to adapt to uh, or, or we'll lose them. Um, and of course, uh, the, what we know most about climate change is the effects of temperature. This is where the models are probably the most accurate. Uh, they're expecting a 4 to, four to 6 degrees rise in average air temperature by 2100, which means a 3 to 5 degree rise in water temperatures. Of course, this depends on stream elevation and stream size and plate where that stream is and so forth. But in general, the stream temperatures are going to increase. And this means lethal temperatures will be more frequent. You look at the Klamath River, for example, which is already in many years marginal for salmonids because of its um, uh, high temperatures. Uh, it's going to be pushed over the brink in many years. And this, the, ex the picture here is, of course, is of that big um, salmon kill in 2002, which was the result of high temperatures coinciding with low flows and then the, resulting in a massive outbreak of disease. You know, it's a very complicated situation, but the, basically the message is, is that high temperatures can help at low flows can trigger uh, major die-offs of fish. Um, and the, 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 most importantly, there will be this general loss of cold water habitat, and cold water meaning water that's 18 to 20, less than 18 to 20 degrees in summer. Um, our, our native salmonids are surprisingly resilient to temperatures. They can stand warm temperatures for a while, but ultimately you need to maintain these cold temperatures uh, if we're going to want our native salmon, the salmonids, to be around in the future. So it's generally cold water or cool water is going to shift northwards and upward, and not a surprise. Um, and that means these habitats become all the more precious as time goes on. And one of the results will be as you get, as our low, lower elevation streams get warmer, uh, they're going to become more dominated by non-native fishes. Uh, so <clears throat> let me now talk briefly about the effects of climate change on our native fish, uh, which is what I'm especially concerned about. Uh, first off, I always like to remind people that we have a very special native fish fauna here, that roughly 80% of our fish are found only in California or in one adjacent state. Uh, that means these, most of our fish are endemic. It means that there's no refuge for these fish outside of California. So that what, if we're going to save these fish, may have them around in the future, it's our job to do so. Nobody else is going to do it for us. Uh, and that's a very important thing to recognize. Um, and we already know that uh, you know 80 percent of these fish are in decline. This is a uh, uh, from a study that uh, we did uh, published in 2011, and it basically shows that 23 percent of our native fishes are already listed. Uh, there's another 22 percent that you could I think that you could make a good case for listing of, uh, and another 28 percent are vulnerable or in decline. So this is not a fish fauna that's doing well right now. Uh, and you can see this uh, with a series of assessments I've made of the California fish fawn over the years. The first one was in 1975. And if you look at the yellow band, that's the vulnerable species. But more importantly is to look at the blue band below that, which is the number of ESA listed species. So you can see that's gone up percentage-wise from 9% percentage of the fauna to 24% today. Uh, these numbers vary somewhat in these various slides I show because I, it, it depends on the database that I'm using where we have good data for some of these fish. Um, and I'd like to point out that there's a um, report that, that uh, by your Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, that uh, we're, that's going to be issued momentarily. Jeff Weaver, one of our co-authors, assures me that 
we're on the verge of getting this finished. Um, and in this report, we're, we've got 70 accounts now of a species of special concern. Uh, 70 of, and that's out of uh, 129 species. That's not a great record. I mean, this this was even surprising to me when I finally compiled all this stuff a few days ago to see where we were on this. Um, and that includes 28, but there are 28 species that are already listed that are not in that 70. Uh, there are 77 species that are extinct, but only 24 species that uh, our analyses suggest are, are, are okay, doing are doing fine and probably well in the future. That's more fewer species than there are listed species. Um, and again, I'd like to point out this is based on some very fairly systematic scoring methods that we've developed. So these our results are repeatable. But and it's also worth remembering that extinction does happen. The uh, uh, thick-tailed chub on the upper part of this picture was disappeared from the state uh, in the 1950s. It was once one of the most abundant fish in the Central Valley. Um, and the bull trout uh, in the lower picture, uh, the last one was caught by one of my graduate students in 1974. Uh, this, this was the next to the last fish shown on this slide. Uh, so it's a, um, uh, we, knew, we do know extinctions happen, and uh, we can't uh, expect them not to happen in the future the way things are going. Well, what's the cause of these native fish declines? It's sort of the one-two punch. The, number, the first punch is habitat loss and degradation. Uh, I'm using this in a very broad sense, everything from the changes in our landscape, the way we use the land to dams and diversions, diversions of water and so forth. Um, and that's always combined with the invasions of alien species. We've got almost 50 species of fish in California we brought into the state um, that are uh, always re ready and waiting to move into uh, our waterways wherever they can. And they're favored especially by altered habitats. So you change the habitat, you improve conditions for the non-native species, and that, dis that displaces the native fishes. Uh, and climate change then becomes an additional stressor on top of the things that are going on anyway. Um, and uh, we've evaluated the effects of climate change uh, in a vulnerability study that was sponsored by the California Landscape Conservation Cooperative, uh, a joint effort of, st of state and federal agencies. Um, and we evaluated the vulnerability to extinction of all the species of fish in California, 120, or not all, because we had some we didn't, just didn't have enough data for, but 121 native fishes and 43 alien species. Uh, and we evaluated their vulnerability to extinction uh, uh, for over a 100-year period, uh, for, for the next 100 years, trying to figure out which ones are most likely to go extinct. Um, and our basic methods were to compile the literature and observations that created this essentially a library, and hopefully a lot of this library is going to be available too, of everything we could find on these fishes. Uh, and then we scored baseline vulnerability to extinction using 10 different metrics, and then scored additional vulnerability to climate change with another 10 metrics. Um, and I'm not going to get into the gory details of this. Uh, this has been published now in PLOS One, and so it's readily available online. The reference is given on here. But our goal was to develop a repeatable, verifiable score for each species. So in theory, anybody could go in to uh, use our metrics, uh, go into the literature to, and, you know, using what they know about a species, and rescore these fish to see if you think, think we're right. Uh, so this is designed to be a... Um, a system where it can be checked. If you don't believe me, you can go and check it yourself. And then it can be repeated in the future. So you can actually have, we have a baseline that we can work from, which has been one of the problems in the past. Uh, there's lack of a real baseline. Uh, well, when you look at the baseline vulnerability of, um, of the 121 native species we scored, you find about half of them are rated as extinct, as critically or highly vulnerable to extinction. Uh, within the next 100 years. That's without climate change. This is an example. Of, this is the Long Valley speckled dace, probably the most endangered fish in California. It's, unfortunately, it's not formally described. But its um, uh, sole habitat is, uh, is, is there, uh, is there water that comes out of a, a swimming pool uh, in, in the Owens Valley. So that's a hot spring swimming pool. So that's not a great, w great way to be. Um, but all non-native species were rated as low with a low vulnerability to extinction. So that suggests the kind of shifts we're likely to see. Um, and then when you look at the scores for climate change vulnerability, uh, what you see on, on this particular graph, which is the um, y-axis shows you the number of taxa that we scored. 
uh, and the uh, x-axis is the lumping these scores into categories, critically vulnerable, highly vulnerable, less vulnerable, least vulnerable, or likely to benefit. And what you see here is those black lines for critically vulnerable and highly vulnerable are for the non-native species. That by and large, 82% uh, of the native species are critically or highly vulnerable to climate change. That's vulnerable to extinction. I want to emphasize that. Whereas the alien fishes is only 19%. So again, not a, not a great story. Uh, so what this means then, in short, is that most native fishes face severe decline or, uh, or extinction in the next 100 years, and that a alien fishes will become increasingly abundant, or at least increasingly dominant in our uh, fresh waters. That's, again, I emphasize if present trends continue, but it doesn't have to be this way. So <clears throat> what can we do? This is where I get to the part that I really like to talk about and I hope can provoke some discussion. Um, first off, I... Um, uh, this background is of a, of a book that's been published, um, and uh, so my first recommendation is be sure you're well informed on California's water issues. Uh, they're horribly complicated, and they're, they're the, but the life of our native fishes really depends on having a lot of people understand um, how our water system works and how it can be manipulated to, uh, to favor native fishes. Um, this book, Managing California Water, is, is available online. It's published by the Public Policy Institute of California with a diverse set of authors from the uh, uh, Center for Watershed Science and the Public Policy Institute. Uh, it, 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 even though I'm a co-author, I think I can recommend it uh, as a very readable summary. The PPIC does a great job with graphics. If you haven't seen this book, it's worth, at least worth browsing through, and it's, the price is right since it's free. Um, but take a look at that online sometime. Um, and the kind of things that I've been working on for a long time is finding out uh, ways you can have a, develop a statewide strategy for aquatic conservation. So that's what we really need. <clears throat> and just doing things piecemeal, piecemeal ultimately is going to fail. Um, and the kind of goals we need to be thinking about for a statewide strategy is to protect, protect examples of all major habitats and I've, I did a classification system with John Ellison of this department a uh, long time ago in which we figured we figured out that there were 160 different kinds of habitats in California. That could be changed, but it <clears throat> gives you an idea of what we're looking at. And uh, uh, we also want to have self-sustaining populations of all native species. At least that's what I want. I hope the rest of you want that too. Um, but here are some key components. Um, uh, that we have to think about if we're developing a statewide strategy. And I just want to go through a bunch of these t today. Uh, and there are others I could have left out, uh, that I did leave out, as a matter of fact. This, a, a statewide strategy is by necessarily um, fairly uh, complex. Well, first off, I <clears throat> the, the drought has let me realize that one thing we do need are native fish rescue facilities. If we're going to be seeing more conditions like this, it means that we are going to get to conditions where streams are going to dry up that contain a species of fish with a very limited distributions. And we need places to put those fish, at least temporarily. We need emergency rooms, essentially, for fish during times like this. Um, one of them is it's, uh, it's still on the drawing boards is a proposed Rio Vista facility for delta fishes, delta smelt and so forth. Uh, we, but we need something more extensive than that that can be used statewide. Um, and one, one way to do it in the short run is to repurpose uh, some of the trout hatcheries. I know this not, would not be a very popular uh, idea. But, for example, the Mount Shasta hatchery has a lot of cold water. It has winter on Chinook if, if get, and get threatened because Shasta Reservoir gets too low, so there's no cold water. One place you can move those fish is to Mount Shasta Hatchery, which has a fairly assured cold core source of cold water. Sort of things like this we need to be thinking about, thinking the unthinkable, so to speak, about what, how, do, how can we save some of these fishes when you have a real emergency. And I would like to see ponds or other facilities developed statewide where you can put fish or even have backup populations. For example, in Clear Lake up in Lake County, it has this, historically had this amazing endemic fauna. There are really only four species left up there in the, in the lake. Uh, and the Clear Lake Hitch has just been as in the process, I hope, of being listed by the Fish and Game Commission as a state endangered species. Uh, we need a backup facility for those fish because they're really declining rapidly. Uh, and that's Clear Lake uh, Hitch, Clear Lake Tule Perch, even the Clear Lake Sculpin. Um, they, we need a place that we could have a, a set aside so that they can be protected in the future. Uh, and that'd be relatively easy to do, but you need to 
obviously a creative facility for that. So that's the kind of thing we need statewide in various places around the state. Um, now, this is a, uh, I don't expect you to read this slide, but <clears throat> it's to show you we've got a very complicated database going for us right now. This is Pisces, um, which has just been developed by the Center for Watershed Sciences and we're, we're hope is going to be adopted fairly widely. Uh, it's a, it's a database basically that tracks changes in fish distribution. We now have it up and running, so we now have statewide distributions of fish uh, in, uh, in hucks around the state. Uh, that's usable for various things. Uh, and this is one way we can you, you, we need the big databases like this and with really smart people running them in order to de show patterns and um, how things change. It also means we have to have monitoring to go along with this so we can, we can look at these patterns. But there's nothing like good graphics to get people thinking about what's going on. For example, this is um, uh, mapping out the <coughs> uh, status of fishes from my 1975 work, uh, comparing it to the work we did in 2010 uh, using this Pisces database. And what you see, the green here is the uh, uh, where the average scores of the of the status of fish is good, uh, whereas the red is that they're on the verge of extinction. And of course, what you see here in this graph is that in 1975, most of the state is green, uh, and in <clears throat> 2010, most of the state is yellow, suggesting that you know showing the decline of the native fishes. And that this is a a system thing. It's not just individual species, but whole groups of species uh, that are declining. Uh, and it's just kind of dramatic things that you can do with a database like this. Uh, and you can also find out to demonstrate how much habitat is protected. And one of the problems we have with aquatic habitats is that, by and large, they're not well protected by our terrestrial system of reserves. Our national parks uh, and uh, nat various reserve systems tend to protect terrestrial habitats, and they don't protect aquatic habitats. And what you see in this map is a little, little I just had it produced yesterday, so it's um, a little harder to see, but the the background colors show the darker the color, the higher the fish species richness. Um, and the protected areas are all shown in green. Uh, and these are protected areas as by the ICUN designations. Um, we, this is something you can get into. But the um, what you notice here, of course, most of the highly protected areas are in the deserts and in the high mountains. And there are not many that are uh, in low elevations for, for aquatic systems. So this is one of the things that we have to think about if we're really going to be protecting uh, fish is finding ways to protect aquatic habitats. And the first thing you've got to do for that is to protect the best of what's left. Find the, the places in the state, and most of you know where these are, I think. Uh, find find um, where the best ones are and, and make special efforts to protect them. Uh, one of my favorite projects in recent years has been working on Blue Creek. Uh, this is where I've been working with the Western Rivers Conservancy, uh, who have in turn been working with the Yurok tribe to develop a um, tribal salmon sanctuary. Blue Creek is a tributary to the Lower Klamath River. It's in the fog belt. It has a good chance of maintaining its flows and being cold uh, for a long period of time. It has the entire suite of uh, salmonid fishes that are in the Klamath River. Um, and now, now it looks like the entire watershed is going to be protected. Uh, this is really significant, and the most significant part about it is the involvement of the Yurok tribe, because they've agreed to essentially be the managers of the system, be the protectors of it uh, for the indefinite future. And that's the kind of thinking we need. We need to be protecting whole watersheds and have a way that they can be protected for the indefinite future. Uh, another good example that involves restoration is big screens. Springs Creek in the Shasta Valley, where we've been working with the Nature Conservancy on um, uh, some of the ranches they've acquired. Uh, Big Springs, uh, if you weren't aware, the Shasta River flows into the Klamath. Big Springs in, in the, is an amazing cold water system where the water comes off Mount Shasta, bubbles up out of the ground uh, as cold water. Uh, in the, this, historically, this, all these springs have been on private land, and that first picture here shows a cow. That's what we, when you first started working that view, you'd see. Especially in the winter, the cows are in the river feeding on the aquatic vegetation because the water is actually warmer than the bitterly cold air up there in the winter. Um, and these spring systems are just trashed. Uh, it's, it's hard, and, and that the picture in 2000, showing you 2009 is what the system was like when Nature Conservancy first acquired this area. Did a very simple thing, fenced it off from the cows, 
and it, it recovered much faster than we ever anticipated it would. Uh, and the, as a result, now uh, it's very rich in aquatic vegetation. The channel's narrowed down. There's a huge abundance of food in there. Coho salmon and steelhead and Chinook salmon are all been spawning in there and rearing their young. So it's a remarkably successful recovery. And the key here it is protecting a cold water habitat, and that's what we need to see more of. Um, so this means one of the main sources of cold, cold water, of course, we have in the state as, is our dams, the cold water pools in our dams. So that's going to be increasingly so in the future. So we do have to be thinking about how do we manage environmental flows below dams? How do we reserve water in these dams uh, to protect our native fishes? The slides here just show Folsom Reservoir and the American River uh, as it looks. I don't know what it looks like quite now after it's rained, but it's been, uh, been pretty low. Um, and we have a study going on at the Watershed Center by uh, Ted Gratham, who's a, 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 uh, a postdoc there. Uh, and he's got this amazing data set he's put together on the characteristics of 1,400 large dams in the state. Um, and we've been looking at uh, w which are the dams that would be, we could provide the most benefit for native fishes below those dams. Uh, we've got 200 candidate dams right now, and we've got 20 case histories we're working on. Uh, this the study should be published fairly soon. But here's the idea of that looking at systematically statewide, which dams can you use uh, to uh, provide environmental flows for native fish and everything else you need. And I always like to remind people that we have, California has some amazingly good legal tools for doing this. Uh, section, first off is Section 5937 of the Fish and Game Code, which was used successfully on Pewter Creek. Um, and, and elsewhere, and, and the Mono Lake decision. This is a law which really says uh, that makes no discrimination between drought-stricken rivers and good times. It says you got to maintain fish populations below dams. Uh, and uh, I hope we can use that in a constructive way in the future. It's really part of the public trust doctrine. If you don't know about the public trust doctrine, get yourself informed. It's also a very important uh, tool to use for this kind of thing. And of course, if we don't use tools like this, we end up using the Endangered Species Act, which tends to be pretty drastic. And it's much better if we can avoid using that, uh, as, except as a, as a very last ditch uh, arrangement. Uh, and of course, we always have to talk about dam removal in the state. There are a lot of dams that are getting old and creaky that need to come down. They're still blocking the, blocking the way. This is a, the classic case, Matillaha Dam. Uh, Rebecca Quinones and I and a group of graduate students have a paper in press on dams to take down in California. Uh, to benefit salmonids. There are a bunch of them. Again, it's expensive, it's hard, uh, but it needs to be done. Um, and the reason for this, of course, is that most of our anadromous fish habitat, the best habitat, is down ab is above the dams. So if we don't take out a few, taking out of some of these dams is a way to, re to provide access to some of these upstream areas that may remain fairly cool uh, even during climate change. And this map here on shows you all the habitat that's above dams in California. Um, and uh, you know, you're statewide, and it's so it's not just in the Central Valley, but it really is a statewide phenomenon. Uh, another thing that we're, has become a fairly recent realization is the idea of managing floodplains for fish. Uh, the uh, the picture of the salmon there is one that's probably one of the most uh, reproduced photographs from our projects I've, I've seen. It's it's uh, was taken by Carson Jeffries of a project that he did on the Cosumnes River, uh, where he compared the growth of um, salmon in, on the floodplain with the growth of salmon in the river. Uh, and the, naturally, the ones, the big fat ones, are the ones that are on the floodplain. Um, and, and the work, we, more, more recent work we've been doing on the Yolo Bypass suggests that for even short periods of time, uh, there are uh, incredible benefits to salmon if they can get on the floodplain and grow like mad for even, even a month or two, um, and then go back out to sea. They, you can get wild fish that look like hatchery fish, they're so big. Um, and this is a, um, uh, it's a, again, it's surprisingly tricky. In the, near the Yolo Bypass, you're having to negotiate uh, with farmers because it's a very productive farming area, with the wildlife area, the needs of wildlife for water, um, uh, and of course, it's pri and for its primary use, which is for flood control. Uh, yet this is a, a, an example of what we need to do more of in the future, and working with diverse interest groups to satisfy the diverse needs, but everybody compromising a little bit. And this, um, this is what I'm talking about a little bit later as, as reconciliation ecology. Um, 
And uh, just get back a little bit to estuaries. We do have to manage our estuaries. They're endangered statewide. Uh, they need a lot of work. A lot of them are diked and dammed and, and diverted. Uh, with sea level rises making the restoration all the more uh, critical, especially finding, finding ways that the estuaries, places estuary habitats can migrate up into. Um, we deal, but we're dealing with decreased inflows of fresh water and severe habitat alteration, and we really do need to have a statewide project on all the estuaries, all these small ones up and down the coast, as well as the big ones like the Delta. And I'm not going to talk much about the Delta, though I could at length, but if you're interested in some of our opinions at the Watershed Center of how to improve the Delta for native fishes, I recommend this um, publication by the Public Policy Institute of California, Where the Wild Things Aren't. Um, and uh, should, it's getting available online and good graphics, fairly easy to read. Uh, and then just a bit of a plug for a book I have coming out. Uh, this is the a book by myself, Amber Manfrey, and Peggy Fiedler on the ecological history and possible futures of Sault Ste. Marsh. Uh, this is really a great project for us. It's a lot of fun to put this put together, to put our thinking together to really say how can you manage Sault Ste. Marsh for the future, uh, uh, especially think with keeping in mind its values for fish and wildlife. But this will be out in March 2014, next, in the next month. Um, published by UC Press. So this is where um, I get into uh, reconciliation ecology. I'm saying going pretty fast here, but I really do want to maintain time for questions. So um, uh, I hope I'm not rushing over this stuff too fast. Um, but reconciliation ecology is a basic approach to conservation that in a way is nothing new, but it's just a good way of thinking about things. Michael Rosenzweig, who, who, who coined the term reconciliation ecology, said he deliberately picked a term that sounded really good, that has a lot of meaning to it, but at the same time people can interpret it in various ways. Um, and basically the approach of reconciliation ecology is to recognize that we humans now dominate all ecosystems. There are really no pristine systems out there, no matter where you go. Um, and most ecosystems, as a consequence, are what we can call novel ecosystems. That is, they are uh, systems that contain lots of a mixture of alien species and native species, and they're highly altered, or altered at least, habitats. In other words, you have species living together, groups of species living together that are not co-evolved. They, they've been thrown together by human uh, endeavors. And they're living in habitats that aren't like the historic, what the historic habitats were like. So that gives us novel ecosystems. That means we have to treat them differently. We have to really look at what we want out of the systems. Uh, we need to look at how we can manage them in ways that favor the species we want. And this means we're in charge, that we are, we are the ecosystem managers. We're, we, we're, we're increasingly going to be playing God on ecosystems all over the world. Uh, and we have to recognize this and make these choices have firm goals in mind of what we want to get out of these systems. Otherwise, they'll just degrade, and we'll lose a lot of the things uh, that we want. Uh, and climate change, of course, just increases this need uh, for them really managing the systems effectively. And um, I, I emphasize, we get to, we're, we're figuring out right now what species you want to save, uh, which ones we will want to have with us in the future. I hope it's going to be our native fish, but there's no guarantee of that. And, and, that, and let me finish this in part by talking about the best example I have of a reconciliation ecology, which is Lower Peter Creek. Now, this Lower Peter Creek uh, by the Davis campus is um, did not start out as being a classic reconciliation project, but it sort of worked out that way. Um, this is a creek which is regulated by dams, the uh, Monticello Dam uh, in the upper watershed and then the Peter Creek Diversion Dam, which sends all this water to uh, Solano County. Um, the, the region I'm talking about is below the diversion dam down to the Yolo Bypass. It's a 30-kilometer uh, reach, uh, which you can call the riparian shred. Uh, it's just this long, narrow habitat. I'll show you a picture of that. It's not natural in almost any of its aspects. Um, and it's truly a novel ecosystem. And <clears throat> the slide I'm showing you was taken a couple of, week, uh, taken a couple of weeks ago, uh, showing you the uh, uh, the creek before the recent rains, but it's what's, what you notice here is it has water in it, and it's got fairly good flows, uh, and that's because of the way it's being managed. Uh, and I like to think it is this model for, recon for a reconciled aquatic uh, and riparian ecosystem. 
this is what it looks like and when you get up in an airplane. This was January uh, 2010 after a nice rainstorm. Um, and you notice how green everything looks compared to what, what it's been looking this year. But notice that shred of habitat. It's just this very narrow ribbon of habitat through this intense agricultural landscape, uh, highly developed landscape. There's not a lot of room for fish and wildlife in this kind of a system. So what we have to make do with what we have. And this is, a, this is the kind of system we try to maximize its benefits to fish and wildlife. Um, and part of the thing you have to recognize in a system like this as well is that how many alien species there are here. This is just a graph that catalogs the percentage of alien species in all the major groups from plants to uh, mammals. Uh, and what you see is that the, the ones that are, have the highest percentage of, of uh, alien species are the herbaceous plants, not surprisingly. Think about the grasses and the foothills, which are almost all non-native, uh, and the fish. Um, but, but all these species, even the butterflies, have a high percentage of alien species. That means this is a novel ecosystem. It's a system made up of native and non-native species that we have to figure out how we want to manage it uh, uh, and, how we, and what we want to manage it for. Uh, we know managing the flow, we can manage the flow for native fish. This is one of the great things that happened. As we, we, of course, had a, had a lawsuit and a trial. But once we got a settlement agreement that, that we, we set up a natural flow regime for the fish, um, in, in, in a good chunk of the creek, we've seen a, we we're able to, by the manipulating the flows, get a shift away from the alien species, which are dominating the stream, and towards the natives. So the, and the interesting thing about this to me is always the water costs have not been all that high. Uh, a lot of it was just manipulating the water uh, in ways, uh, the existing water supplies in ways that were beneficial to the fish. In this case, we had to get more water for the creek in general, but, the, but the, I think the water agency is now a, a full-blown cooperator on these results, in part because the water costs are not as high as it might have been anticipated. But the good thing is, this suggests that we, with smart use of water, we can get native fishes back and maintain them. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the Pewter Creek is also more than just about fish, although that's how it started. Uh, it's now about wildlife and so forth. There's a lot of interesting work being go done to increase wildlife populations, including nest boxes, great community involvement in all this. And what you see, the numbers of, of a variety of whole nesting birds has gone up dramatically along the creek, largely because of what they call the nest box highway along the creek. Um, so, but the flows, getting more water in the creek started the whole situation and improved the riparian vegetation. It made it possible then for people to get excited about the creek, build nest boxes, and then improve the conditions for these, um, uh, for the native birds. So the question is, what does it take to manage Peter Creek as a reconciled ecosystem? Uh, and it's not, again, these things are never easy, but I think that's why this creek gives such a is such a good example. First off, it takes vision, and that vision was really stated in the Pewter Creek Accord, which was followed the, 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 law, the legal settlement, which really said that we, that we were going to try to restore the creek uh, into a functioning ecosystem. Um, and of course, it takes water, and again, that was a result of the lawsuit, but it, the result has been, but it's smart flows in the creek that really make it work. Uh, and the, the, the rest of these things are things that it has taken to make this really work. First off, the water agency cooperation. Uh, after this really fierce struggle in the courtroom, uh, we now everybody is working together, and the, and the Solano Water Agency is a is a prime uh, cooperator in making things work out there. Uh, one of the best things that happened was the uh, was uh, adopting the idea of a streamkeeper, which is you, there's a full time employee actually now works for the, for the Solano Water Agency, a full time employee who does nothing but look after the creek. This is a fellow, Rick Marovich, who goes around and raises money to do a restoration project. He talks to the landowners when there's any complicated issues. He works on fisheries issues. He works on everything he can to, to bring people together. His job is to make sure that if the, the stream has a functioning ecosystem that works. Um, and that's really quite amazing. He's, a, of course, an especially effective individual. But the idea of, I love the idea of every stream in California having a stream keeper, somebody who's in charge of the stream. Uh, to make it work in their local communities. And of course, community involvement then becomes a big part of this as well. The Pewter Creek Council uh, is a very active organization. It has been from the very beginning, but there's lots of people out there planting trees and doing all kinds of things in the creek. Whenever there's a need for volunteers, uh, there's a call goes out and a lot of people show up. Uh, landowner cooperation is always a, an issue. 
and Peter Creek is mostly flowing mostly through private land. We could not be doing what we're doing without private landowners, and they're doing a lot of restoration on their own land uh, of or riparian habitat. So once again, this whole thing has sort of just been building up as people get more enthralled with what, they're, what the creek is doing, they become cooperators. Again, uh, the stream keeper has a lot to do with this because he's the person who works with the private landowners and assures them that what they're doing is good. Uh, and finally, the, as part of the accord, we got a monitoring program going where we monitor both the fish in the creek and the wildlife we, so we know what's going on. Uh, we have good trend data on all the, uh, all the major species. Uh, and that's something that's very unusual. We need to do more of in this state. So uh, that's reconciliation ecology. And I'd like to um, sort of close by making the plea that recognize that if we're going to do wide-scale conservation, you need money. Uh, and, and lots of it. And frankly, we're in an era where apparently we're going to go into building a lot of new water projects of various sorts, whether it's the tunnels through the delta, new dams, or whatever. They're going to happen. Uh, it's hard, hard to see it not, not happening unless we get totally screwed up in some of our political battles. Um, and we need to make sure that, that, that the fish are part of the, the, this, the, this, all this money that's going to be made available for projects, and these projects consider fish as part of it, both in the short term and the long term. We need to hitch our wagon to these particular stars, I think. Uh, I hate to, do, hate to talk about it that way in a way because I'm, I would like to see less of this going on, but the reality is it's going to happen, uh, and we should hitch our, we could try to find any way we can to get the large amounts of money we need to do an appropriate job of, of, of managing the fish uh, in California and their aquatic ecosystems. Um, I might point out a good way to get started thinking about this is to read uh, the blog that was posted this morning uh, on the Center for Watershed Sciences website by Jay Lund and Ellen Hannock and so forth on why give away fish flows for free during a drought. Uh, this is all about Making, trying to find ways to raise money for fish um, with using the tools that we have. So that's the California, that's the California Water Blog. Okay, so in conclusion then, um, we need systematic actions to save California's endemic aquatic species. I like to think we can do it. Uh, I'm an, fundamentally an optimist. It does take a lot of work and a lot of money to do it though. Uh, and I hope that all of you are will be involved in that one way or another because climate change is accelerating the rates of declines and that means we are we have to move fast if we're really going to save a lot of these fish uh, and this recent drought is just an example of what's to come uh, but as i always emphasize that's if we let present trends continue and we don't have to uh, so thanks and i'll be happy to take questions I went through a lot of stuff very fast. <laughs> yeah. Can I pause you for just a second? Um, and then it's just okay. because the people on WebEx won't be able to hear questions. Oh, okay. If you could them, that would I need to repeat the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, easy question first. The question is all about what's the best way to get water across the delta to the pumping plants? Um, that's an engineering thing. Um, I, I, I don't know the best way to do it, whether it's a big pipe or a small pipe or a canal. Uh, but, but we do need to change the way that uh, – what I do know is that we do need to change the way water moves across the delta. We need to find ways to um, – get the estuary working again, get the delta working as part of the estuary so the dominant flows are upstream, downstream, rather than across the delta. And unfortunately, that un involves some kind of large-scale scale manipulation uh, of, the, of the water. Uh, well, and and you, you look at the, the, the proposals for the big um, tunnels under the delta, for example, uh, the, in, at, at one high level, they make a lot of sense because of the that we've gone so far with the water system already, and the delta is so such an altered ecosystem that that combination of things says we got to do something drastic, and those big tunnels may be one way to do it. Then, the, then the big question is then because who do you trust? That's what I really what it's all about. Can we, if we build those, will they be operated in the best way possible for the ecosystem? And that's always to me the biggest single problem. 
but the trends right now are in the Delta is a place where the trends don't look good for native fish. So we got to do something, um, whether it's the tunnels or something else. But whatever we do, it's going to take lots of money uh, for habitat restoration and, and lots of water, presumably for the fish. Unfortunately. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Blew you all away. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. The question was all about monitoring. What are some programs? Uh, I mentioned the need for monitoring. What are some of the programs that we need to do? Um, I have so many ideas along this line. I, I have to st have to stop myself from just babbling. But the um, one thing I'd like to point out that the Department of Fish and Wildlife has one of the best aquatic fish monitoring programs anywhere, which is the Wild Trout Program. Uh, which does a systematic sampling of streams around the state, cold water streams, of course, uh, using three-pass electrofishing. It has this amazing database that needs to be more available, actually, than it is. Uh, but it's getting there. And that is an uh, example of a database that, of a program that could be expanded uh, into including other kinds of streams uh, and to use as a, a drought monitoring program, either, or a, a program to monitor changes uh, as a result of climate change. Uh, that's something I would just love to see be made bigger and better. Uh, there are lots of other opportunities out there. This is, a, you know, the, the need for information on our streams is very high, and I see this as a wonderful opportunity for citizen monitoring um, or for uh, all these biologists who are out there working for consulting firms or agencies. Something you know, they, they do when they're bored, bored on a weekend, go out and sample their local stream and deposit in a systematic way and put that data in, in, a, uh, uh, in a database. Even going to, there are things like this that are developing right now, but just going out and taking photographs of streams uh, with standard photographic points so you can see how the streams are changing in response to drought and uh, other things would be very helpful. But the point, I think, is always monitoring is really important. That's why Pewter Creek works so well is that we know what's going on. We need more of that and we need it at the local and state levels. Uh, and it needs to be, it doesn't, it, ideally it would be funded by the agencies, but there's a lot of it that could be done just with existing uh, resources and, and using people who are out there. Uh, yeah. The question, if I understand it, was about using drones for monitoring, uh, and, and there are all kinds of legal constraints against this, and can it be done? I must admit, I had my first experience with this two weeks ago on Susie Marsh. We had a helicopter drone. Uh, where we were doing a study of the way one uh, of the most natural uh, sloughs in the marsh works, and we had a helicopter drone overhead taking photographs uh, as the tide was rising and falling on one of these big spring tides. So they're a marvelous tool. Um, but the legal issues, there are people out here <laughs> who maybe could, could address that, but I certainly can't. Uh, I, I like the idea, certainly, because I know they, they, they have so much potential. And we have to be looking around for innovative ways to do our monitoring, of whether it's water quality, water in the streams, or whatever. Does anybody out here have, have any comments on that at all? Comment back there, yeah. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I did hear the first part of your question. What do we have? The uh, my ears are still plugged for my cold. Okay, if I gather your question, you're asking about the Shasta River project uh, with uh, uh, Nature Conservancy, and how did we decide on that as a project? Uh, or, or how did they figure out what to, that that was? Because um, the, the, uh, this is all about the Shasta River, and and how does the Nature Conservancy and UC Davis, when they're working together, figure out about this project, and 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 how much? You know how much land do you buy? Essentially, how much water can you buy to make this work? Um, this is a very this, the Shasta River project is a very uh, interesting one because the Nature Conservancy just went out and bought a couple of ranches uh, uh, and paid a fairly large sum of money for them, uh, lar largely on our recommendation. Though I must admit that we were pushing them to do it. They came to us and asked if it was a good idea, and we just jumped up and down and said yes, yes, yes. Um, and it's, and it's as, I, as I showed in my talk, it's the, the rest of the restoration has worked much better than we ever thought. Uh, but part of what the Nature Conservancy is doing there is trying to do, do some demonstration projects too, to find ways that so that the local farmers uh, can improve their management practices that will also improve the health of the Shasta River. Because one of the major problems we have out there is that. Uh, it's mostly flood irrigated pasture and alfalfa. And when you flood irrigate pasture and alfalfa, uh, the excess water flows over the fields and then it flows back into the river. And by the time it's flowed over a field where the blazing sun, it can be 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, and quickly, the river warms up to a point where it can no longer support cell monads. So the Nature Conservancy then has been looking at ways to manage to keep farming on one of these ranches they have, the Elson Ranch. But find ways to do it that doesn't put this return water back in the river. Uh, and they're hoping by example to show other ranchers uh, how they can do that. So that's, then that project was decided upon, though, just simply because we were both the Nature Conservancy and Davis, you see, our, my group at Davis, were looking around the state for where are cold water places that have the greatest potential for restoration or can be improved uh, for some on it. And the Shasta River always came out of the top of our lift partly because it flows into the Klamath. It historically was, though a relatively small river, one of the big salmon producers in the river system, uh, and it had declined to almost nothing. So here was a situation where it seemed you could do a lot uh, for a relatively modest investment, although I guess TNC did not regard their investment in that, those ranches as modest at the time. But it was a wonderful thing they did. Yeah. The question is about fish passage and um, uh, how, uh, how do we develop, improve fish passage in a way, I'm, I'm sort of reinterpreting your question, but how do, how, how do we um, improve fish passage in a way that includes all the species out there? Because traditionally fish passage salmon liners, for example, have been for salmon uh, and don't, often don't pass other fish very well. Um, well, that's one reason I like to take down dams or think that's a great way to do things. That improves that upstream-downstream connections. That's certainly one way to do it. But there are only a limited number of dams that are available for taking downs, but uh, that always should be a, a, a consideration. Uh, and the design of our fish ladders is, um, by and large, you know, set up for salmon. But, you know, most of our dams are not passable anyway, so uh, what fish ladders we have could probably need to be rebuilt and redesigned, and some of them are in that process right now. Uh, but it's always going to be a problem. A, a, a design that's optimal for salmon is not going to work well for sturgeon. 
Uh, fortunately, I've noticed that suckers and pike minnows and hardheads can sometimes make it over salmon ladders. Lampreys can if you improve, change them a little bit. But but you, you're you're right in that the design of any place we're rebuilding ladders should include the other fishes. And I think, you know, I, th the, 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 I like to think engineers are can-do people. They can always figure out ways to improve designs. <laughs> The question is, uh, is how do you reconnect rivers to floodplains? But you know, specifically, there's the weir at the upper end of the Yolo Bypass is what uh, keeps the bypass from flooding a good deal of the time. Of course, that weir is set up so it will flood at, under high flows. Uh, and that's an example of where everybody's trying to scratching their heads and trying to figure out how to make that system work better. Uh, do you put a, a notch in the weir? Do you create a series of, of gates? that allow water to flow through uh, at the appropriate times? If so, if you do it during low flow events rather than high flow events, how much flooding do you allow? And how do you, how do you know those fish are actually going to use it? How do you get that fish through those gates and onto the bypass? Uh, those are questions we still don't have good answers for. But um, I think they, our work on the Columbia's River has certainly demonstrated that in places where you have natural uh, flooding, just breaching the levees is often enough to do it. But generally, it's much more complicated than that. And the, the, some days, the levee breaches have created this marvelous floodplain, but it's small. Uh, the Yellow Bypass is the future because it's so large, but it's also the kind of floodplain that has to be highly manipulated. Um, and we'll see more of this. And we're t they're talking about it on the San Joaquin side and so forth as well. But it does have to be done carefully, and there's no, uh, no easy solutions. Um, it does take good engineering that really figures in the fish, uh, that, that creates opportunities that the fish will take advantage of. You know, fish aren't very smart, so you, you do have to work it out so they can find these places. Oh, okay. What, uh, so what methods are most effective for perennial cold water streams? Uh, well, when private landowners are involved, you have to do what we've done on Pewter Creek, is just get them, get them involved in the conservation. Uh, and, you know, and the same thing's true on the Shasta River. And in general, um, while you always find some people who are going to be holding out no matter what, I think if people are well-informed, they're much more willing to cooperate and, and do what they can. Uh, I think the part of the solution is to really identify where are the best places. Uh, that's what, which in the Shasta River, that's what the Nature Conservancy did. They determined that Big Springs was the best place in that whole river system to, to focus on. Um, and we need so we need to have a better idea of where these cold water streams are. What are the best ones to protect, and where can we put our money? Uh, because part of the solution, of course, is to buy water rights or even to um, lease land or, or lease the water from landowners. You know, find, in other words, finding ways you can cooperate with landowners to make these things happen. Uh, I think we need a toolbox, a whole variety of things that we can use. Uh, but it's only going to happen if we really get good cooperation from a lot of different people, and, and especially private landowners, because I agree that a lot of this land, a lot of these streams are in private land uh, and do need to be uh, – we, I mean, you can't really protect the resources there if the landowners are not working with you. Sort of a blah answer, but uh, that's what I can come up with for now. <laughs> um, on major off-stream reservoirs, sites reservoir. Uh, sites reservoir, off-stream reservoir. I don't have any good comments on this, really. Uh, <laughs> You know, because it, it depends on how well you buy the arguments. Sites reservoirs design is the whole idea is to increase flexibility of operation, uh, and that's we do need that flexibility. We do, and we do need flexibility that allows us to use more cold water for fish, whether sites reservoir or temperance flat or these new new dams uh, are solutions or not. I just don't know, um, and I don't think anybody really does. Uh, although there are obviously a lot of people out there who are absolutely convinced they're the right thing to do.
fish rescue. So do I need to repeat these questions too? Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Um, so the question was about fish rescue. That's a really interesting question, you know, because the Department of Fish and Game, as it was then, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the 1930s engaged in massive fish rescue programs uh, that were regarded as the prime way to save salmon and steelhead, uh, and also while also employing lots of people, I might add. Uh, and, and that sort of thing has sort of gone out of favor uh, for good reason, because it, 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 I mean, you start studying it, you find it for the most part it didn't do much good. But I think there are cases where fish rescues can actually make a difference, where streams get very low unexpectedly, fish do get trapped, and you can and you have a place to move them to. That's also though why I'm especially as um, streams get really low for lo fish that are that are locally endemic, like the red heels roach, for example. It would be good to have be able to a place that you could put rescued fish at least temporarily until stream slopes come back. That's why I, I think we need some rescue some facilities where we can take we can do rescues if we have to. Uh, as a regular management procedure, it's not a great idea because it it, it just assumes that you can uh, degrade the streams and then rescue the fish as as they dry up. Um, I much prefer to have flow in the streams rather than going out and rescuing fish. But I must admit, rescuing fish makes a lot of people feel good. So there is some plus to that. <laughs> oh, the outline the, the Peter Creek monitoring program. Yeah, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, provided by the. Actually, that's a slight exaggeration, but it's in, in, it, it, it varies from year to year. But it's in that ballpark, uh, and uh, SAX. I'm sorry, I spoke on a turn. It's not 200,000. It's like more like 100. But whatever it is, it's enough to sponsor two teams. One is a, a, a they, they actually hire a consulting firm to do the, the fish the basic fish sampling uh, to keep it consistent. Then they pay for the um, UC Davis to hire to maintain a program of monitoring the uh, um, uh, of, uh, plants and birds and fish and the terrestrial habitats. So, uh, but it's paid for by the Slaughter Water Agency as part of the settlement agreement, and it's, uh, and it's very effective. And it's, it's relatively cheap. As I, I know I get the, got the numbers totally wrong, but it's relatively cheap because uh, a lot of the work's being done by students, uh, which is a real plus of having this creek that's flows by a university. And the students get training as a result of that, too. Somebody else want to answer that question? <laughs> uh, what role can the well the federal government is clearly you know has has a lot of authority. It, it, one is using the Endangered Species Act in as flexible a way as possible, uh, and you know what what I really like to see is expanded state and federal agencies dealing with fish issues so they could really do the jobs they're supposed to be doing, uh, especially in terms of trying to. Uh, manage all our endangered fishes around the state. You know, we do need to get a much more fish listed. So I'd love to see the whole listing process accelerated for some of these species so we get, could get more of them listed. But I know the, the federal aid state, especially the Fish and Wildlife Service, is just overwhelmed with those, that kind of work. Um, so I don't have any great ideas beyond it just to keep doing what they're doing, but only more of it. Uh, especially for the, I'm talking about the fish agencies primarily uh, and finding ways to better um, manage uh, the, the streams and, and what the other one thing of course is finding ways to um, better regulate um, dams it's certainly the Bureau of Reclamation has a lot to say about that uh, better regulation of flows from dams to improve things for native fish is certainly should be high on the agenda and for President Obama I would say uh, yes I'm going to make sure the San Joaquin River keeps flowing Good to a pool for political leverage. 
My agency has historically tried to marshal our, con our constituency of anglers um, for support of species preservation when we can tie preservation to continued angling opportunities. Will this now become an outmoded strategy? Um, actually, that's a very good question because uh, times are changing. Uh, people are not, are, there's an expanded interest in catching non traditional fish. Uh, there's several things going on here in California. Uh, first off, you know, as, as trout and salmon populations decline, and I hope we can maintain them at least for, for fisheries, especially commercial fisheries, um, the people do look for other sources. And, you know, I, I, there's several people I work with on a regular basis who are developing life lists of fish they've caught, which I think is sort of neat. Um, I, you, you find there's an increasing interest in uh, carp fishing, for example. Carp are an amazing fish. They're everywhere. They get big. They're hard to catch. They're smarter than most of the salmonids. Uh, so there's a, promoting fisheries like that can actually be a good deal. Um, a lot of our native fishes you know, uh, can be caught. Uh, either by catch and release fishing, even, or by, by I, my, I have a brother in law, for example, who fishes ca catch and release only for carp. So there are lots of people like this out there that we need to think about. And the native fish is the same way. And most of these fish are edible, despite the fact that our cultural tradition says you've got to have a nice, easy little fillet uh, to eat. If you find that the, the culinary traditions of many cultures include whole fish, whole fish that are quite bony. Uh, and we can change that culture. Uh, there are lots of ways that we can use our native fishes and species like carp. I might add that one of my things I've always, my, my great dreams is to find a way to get delta smelt numbers up high enough so we can harvest them. Because they, they have a huge potential as an edible fish. There's an equivalent species in Japan that's one of the most highest priced fishes on the, on the fish markets there. So if we can I can imagine the fishery for delta smelt that actually exports them to Japan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, will tight fees be incorporate existing data sets from agencies and Yeah, P Pisces is designed to be a, a database to incorporate data from any source, uh, especially once it really gets rolling. Uh, our, our intention is to make it uh, an, an open uh, access resource, one that people can use and can, can contribute to. We, a lot of the details we haven't figured out on that yet, but that's the basic idea, because we need to get data from all kinds of sources. Uh, and for example, that amazing database that Fish and Wildlife has on from the Wild Trout Program is not really in it yet, and that eventually it will be. That's the kind of thing we need to get in there, and ideally we would have monitoring programs all over the state that could contribute to a, a database like this. Yeah, well, the dif difference is a stream keeper is a, is a holistic. A uh, water master is dealing only with the water issues, you know, who gets what water in a, in a stream system. Um, their idea is to make sure, you know, usually there's, a, there's an adjudication that's taken place and the water master is the person who's making sure everybody follows the rules. Um, the stream keeper is different. This is a person who's out there uh, without much legal authority in a sense, but who has the moral authority, I like to think, uh, of being the person everybody knows who's in charge of the stream, who can goes up and down, and, and when, if the flows are not looking right, he can go talk to the water agency and say, we need to do something about this. If there's a need for uh, a, a restoration project, like the creek's eroding underneath the road, he can go out and find the money uh, to, to reorient the stream or to do large-scale eradication programs of Arundo or something of this nature. So the idea of a stream keeper is somebody who is looking at the entire ecosystem and is working with people can, and working with the communities to really make sure the stream is, is kept well, essentially. But the water master is a very narrow role, so it's really not a, a good comparison at all. I have one last question. Um, is it more realistic for a positive outcome to restore areas that have been Uh, this is comparing a novel ecosystem with a near pristine. Well, the, the problem with the near pristine ecosystem, I'd, lo I'd love it if we could do it, but I just don't think it's possible. There are very few places that we can even approach near pristine in California. Uh, you just have to look at uh, 
riparian plants, for example, everywhere, everywhere you go, they're going to be a 50-50 mixture of native and non-native species. Uh, we temp t typically have non-native fish and the invertebrates, crayfish, for example, are everywhere in our aquatic system. So from an aquatic perspective, it's very hard to find anything that's near pristine. So I think, uh, and if you do find one, it's going to be a very small area. So my, um, my, my general feeling is that realistically, most places we're going to manage for the protection of native biodiversity are going to be novel ecosystems. They're going to contain non-native elements, and they're going to be manipulated in one way or another by humans. That's just, to me, the reality of the world we're living in right now. I wish it wasn't, but I think realistically that's what we have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the question is about uh, trapping and trucking, moving uh, uh, salmon and steelhead above dams and then collecting them and moving them back down below dam. In other words, you can't remove the dams, so you move the fish up upstream. Like winter run Chinook salmon into the McLeod River is sort of the classic example that's talked about. Um, well, it's, I, I can see under times of drought, and maybe something we'll have to try, uh, I think if things really get tough for winter-run Chinook salmon, I could see trying to move them into the McLeod River, for example, or, or the Upper Sacramento River. Uh, but by and large, I think it just does, isn't. It's not going to count. Doesn't work very well. It's very expensive uh, to trap these fish to move the adults. We can do it, but then the, the, and then you get them to spawn. But then the biggest problem is how do you get those juveniles back again? Because their typical juvenile Chinook, for example, is going to be moving downstream during high flow events. Uh, and they're going to get washed into a reservoir, and they aren't going to make it out of that reservoir. Uh, although I could say, in parenthetically, they can develop populations in the reservoir. Uh, that's what just happened in a number of places. But so if you're going to rely on trapping and trucking, you're, you're trapping the juveniles and trucking them back down around the dams is very, very difficult to do effectively. And so I just see it as a poor use of resources. Uh, maybe it'll have to be done at some point. But I think the chances of success are relatively low, and the costs are very high. Jeff. Uh, the question was about will these fish, um, if they're trapped and trucked, will they will they stray more? Uh, the the record would, from hatchers would seem to indicate that, yeah, that they, need, they would need that continuous imprinting all the way down. So, yeah, that's a, something I had not thought about, but certainly that would seem to be a logical argument to make. Uh, but if you're desperate, you know, that may be the only choice we have at times. I say thank you and close it off? Hey, thank you, everybody. Great questions. <laughs>